uh, our next guest has done some video games from time to time and has uh, done some slot machines. Uh, a lot of those video games were driving games, which would be no surprise to many of you. And uh, the presentation, though, is entitled Pinball is My Life, and I think you see good justification for that. There will be some time for questions, and when we do the questions, we're going to have you line up and come down the side of the room here. So if you remember how we did it last year, so you, when you have a question to ask, don't ask from way in the back, come down to here. All right? So without further ado, here's Steve Ritchie, and we need to just get this launched, and then we'll go. great to be here. I've never been out to the show and it's like, it's a cool show. Maybe they all are. I don't know. I do like pinball. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to set this up here. I'm just going to put a picture up there for now. Why isn't it working? Because I don't know how to work it. <laughs> anyway, pinball is my life. It has been for Wow, ever since I can remember. And there were times when I couldn't play or couldn't think about it in, in my past, but uh, I, I grew up in California. Uh, <clears throat> I think it was 1955, the first time my dad took me to this place called Playland at the Beach. You know, it's, it was, it's a very old amusement park. It's gone now in San Francisco near the Cliff House. And uh, that was the first time I ever played pinball. And it was so weird because the pinball machines were bolted to like a big shelf, you couldn't wiggle them or do anything. You know, you just, and um, it was weird. Anyway, <laughs> uh, he, he took me there a few times. So then my next, uh, you know, my parents were going to a bowling league, so I would always go to Sea Bowl in Pacifico with them and play these machines. And there would be Gottlieb games there, mostly Gottlieb, occasionally a Williams. And it's like, I would play them. I, mean, I think there were like three games for a quarter at that time. And I would try to win some replays, and occasionally I would. I'm not a great player, but, uh, you know, I do okay. <clears throat> Back then I didn't do very well, I don't think. Didn't get many free games. But, you know, one day I was there, I guess it was one night, and uh, something was wrong with the machine. It was out of order, so a guy came in, you know, and, <coughs> excuse me, took the glass off. He lifts up the play field, and I'm standing there looking at it. And it's a Gottlieb game. And uh, the stuff inside was all shiny and cool. It's like, he told me, he said, godly machines are the Cadillac of the industry. And I said, well, how does it work? And he have, he'd say, I'd have to spend hours to tell you. I did know about electricity. I was also, I don't know, when I was a kid growing up, my teachers sort of voted me uh, most likely to be a mad scientist in a toy factory. <laughs> that's, that's what I grew up to be. And uh, it's been fun, crazy too. Um, I like to tinker with stuff. Like, you know, I'm an idiot too. I mean, that's how you learn things if you're an idiot on the way. Um, like, uh, I had a Honda CL, no, CB350, and I took the baffles out of the pipes, okay? And I was commuting from San Jose to San Francisco uh, in the middle of the Golden Gate Bridge, here at Wayne Island. I was in the Coast Guard. So I took the baffles out, and when I drove through San Francisco, okay, the pipes rattled the windows on, in North Beach, you know, Van Ness Avenue, and I, I, it's amazing that I did it for this long. So I had them out for about a week, and then I went home one, one night um, on Highway 101 and just opened the bike up all the way, and, and it just went poof, and the engine just locked up. See, I squeezed the clutch, pulled over the side, asked for help. Anyway, it turns out that if you don't adjust the fuel mixture <laughs> and you take the baffles out of the pipe, things get real hot. I melted holes in the piston, both of them. So I picked up the engine after I took it out of my bike, way down like three floors below, brought it up to my kitchen table apartment and ripped into it over the manual. It was kind of, it was interesting and I did fix it. Anyway, back to pinball. Pinball. Later on, I played some when I was in the Coast Guard, but not too often, didn't have a lot of opportunity. I spent four years in the Coast Guard learning electronics with the hope of becoming a, an electronics technician, you know, or something, engineer when I got out and used the GI Bill. 
Well, by the time I got out of the Coast Guard, I hated electronics. I didn't want to have anything to do with it. I just didn't. I, I knew I knew what I wanted to know, and the mystery was gone. You know, I don't know. It wasn't that cool for me. So I played in a bunch of rock bands, played pinball pretty often at that time when I got back. You know, I guess I got out of the Coast Guard in 1972. Played in a bunch of bands, painted address numbers on curbs. I owned a plant store, you know, for, I, I mean, it was like a tiny little room, you know. My wife and I, Diana, would operate this plant store, make hardly any money. So, but I was always playing music, always being in bands, and uh, making very little money. And I just got tired of being poor. And uh, we moved to San Jose, to another apartment, and uh, I was walking around looking for a job. And I walked into Atari, and Atari was, Okay, I'm a pig, here's the deal. When I walked in there, there were so many beautiful young ladies just running around. I mean, it, it was interesting. And they had, they had a stereo everywhere in the building, including in, you know, in the reception area. And it's like, it was all done like kind of hippie stuff, like shingles on the inside and, I don't know, barnwood. It was very weird. And, uh, David, uh, I ended up speaking to a guy, and I got a job there as an electromechanical technician. So, um, thanks. It isn't there, though. That's interesting. Okay, good. Good. Is it upside down? No. Okay, this is a picture in the factory. We'll get to that in a minute. Anyway, so I walked into Atari. Uh, the first thing they gave me was a... Uh, like a universal tester. They wanted me to build it and design it, and I did know how to do that, and, and so I made a universal tester for all the different games with, you know, all the voltages you need to plug in the board. So you just take a board and put it in there, and had a steering wheel and joystick so you could play tank, or uh, what was it? Grand Track Track 10. 10. That's right, Track 10, tank, uh, all those cool games. And then um, after that, I built burning ovens, and uh, using bus bar and asbestos covered wire so we could burn, you know, you know, 100 boards at a time. Anyway, uh, one day, uh, I guess it might have been Nolan, might have been Nolan Bushnell or another vice president, probably Gene Lipkin, yeah, and he said, would you like to be employee number two of our pinball division? And I didn't know we were going to make pinballs, and I thought, wow, we're going to make pinballs here. I mean, it was not a a product that Atari uh, could build while I was there. I mean, there was no, there was nothing. There was no line there. I mean, it, it, these were all electronic games. There was lines, but just for video games. You know, you slap in a power supply and a control panel and the, the PC board and the monitor and speakers and you're kind of done and pfft. And uh, the pinball was much more labor intensive. So, I was amazed that they were gonna do this. So. He gave me the job of overseeing the pinball lab, and, and then they hired this guy, just one other guy. They hired him before me. His name was Bob Jonasy, and he came from Williams to Atari. And he said he was a game designer, but he really wasn't, I found out later. He was, he was an engineer, a mechanical engineer. Not that he didn't know how to put together pinball machines, he did. And he taught me how to assemble one, how things go. Um, he, you know, and then we got a couple of machines, and then I could really, you know, dig into them. We got a uh, space mission, I think, and then um, uh, Captain Fantastic. <coughs> so both great games, you know. And it's like I got to get in there and move the pins around and change the scores, and and he would come in and yell at me because I changed them, you know. I, I, he was he would say, "This company's never going to build pinball," and we almost didn't. I mean, it was like it was a miracle that that it came together. So. I built prototypes for him, uh, Batarians, uh, the, uh, maybe the worst game on earth, Time 2000. A set of flippers over here and a set of flippers over here. Your brain didn't know what to do. They tried this, they tried that. And they went like that, but when the ball went over there, your instinct was to hit the left button, even though, even, I don't know. <laughs> and then they tried this and it was even worse, and this is how they produced it. You press the, the right flipper button, and both flippers flip over here, and both flip over here. It was ridiculous. I think the central feature was a captured jet bumper. And uh, they even ruined that, kind of, because it stayed in there too long. So they changed the angle of the rubber to get it in and out. So the one feature was kind of dead. And Anyway, I did laugh because 
I just couldn't help it. And I started thinking, I could do better than this. I just, you know, I want to try it. So I, I went home, uh, let's see, a piece of plywood and a, a sheet of mylar, drawing mylar. And I drew a game on it. It was called Airborne Avenger. I didn't know that that was going to be the name of it um, until later, but I did name it. And it I remember Roger Sharp in his review, he said, Airborne Avenger, you have to spell that out. That's a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was ridiculous, okay? This is a guy, you know, I was just a goofy kid. I mean, it's like a dopey game, but I did learn how to make pinballs, and we sold some. After that, I worked on Superman, and, and Superman was a much better game. I ended up doing like five White Woods on the way. I mean, just one after another. I hated different things about it. On the fifth Whitewood, though, it played pretty good. And I, uh, I met Eugene Jarvis there also, uh, one of the great pinball programmers, or game programmers of all time. And we became uh, good friends. And uh, wow, <clears throat> that's a story in itself. Um, anyway, we made those two games together, Airborne Avenger and Superman. And they wouldn't really let me. My boss would not let me make a pinball machine. I had to take my drawing to Nolan Bush now and say, can we make this? And he said, did you do that at home? And I said, yes. <laughs> then we can try it. So he gave me a drafting table and a cubicle. And um, uh, I was a game designer. Anyway, after, after Superman, actually, it never even came out. Uh, I ended up getting an offer from Williams that I could not refuse. And watching Atari stumble and fumble and bumble everything, play fields coming in from Chicago, you'd open the, the back of the truck and they'd all be warpy. And I, we didn't know how to fix them, we didn't know anything. You know, even the bosses, nobody knew, okay? It's like, I, I mean, it would be humid in Chicago, they'd get to California and it'd be dry and the wood would just bang. Uh, there were thousands of other problems. Ad Poster also made our uh, back glasses um, in Chicago. In fact, almost everything was imported from there. Bally clippers, uh, and of course these rotary solenoids, which were total damage. This is a bunch of clowns, and I, I say that respectfully. <laughs> okay, no one push now. Uh, um, uh, Al Alcorn, uh, a bunch of guys in the design department, Pete Takahichi, they're all sitting around going, wouldn't it be cool if the displays were down here? Where, where no one could see them, <laughs> where, where they were totally worthless and kind of not working all the time and a mess, okay? And we want to use rotary solenoids. That was Nolan Bushnell's baby, made of lead X's, which are channel changers for old shortwave radios. Automatic. I mean, if, like, if you were on the bridge and your radio was down there, you could change the channel on the radio up there or down here on this deck. That's what they were designed for, not for. Wham! Not for flippers, they would fall apart. I don't know if you guys have ever seen an Atari rotary flipper or uh, it's just a mess, a train wreck. We had a, I guess three or four of us went to Nolan and finally said, can we stop doing this? Can we just do linear, you know, solenoids? Can we make flippers with, you know, with plungers that get pulled in like everybody else? And finally he said yes. So they ended up being on Superman and, and from then forward. All right. Getting back to the offer from Williams, this guy Mike Stroll, he comes out to California, he brings Steve Kordek with him. And uh, he was a charismatic, sorry, charismatic guy, definitely. He was like a, I don't know, he had a great personality, he was definitely a salesman, but he was also an electronics guru, and he had come out to Chicago from California, from Silicon Valley also. So I was very interested. Um, to go, and they made me a great offer, and um, I packed up everything, we flew, flew to Chicago, and on the plane, this is the only time this has ever happened to me, ever, I had a napkin drawing of a game that I wanted to call Flash, with a, a cross shot, because, I don't know, I, I think, you know, 4 million BC kind of influenced me, that whole, you know, that Ted Zale, man, he was, he was like way ahead of his time. Um, anyway, I had the name, and I knew that I wanted to have flash lamps in the game. Because, you know, you, you get in your car, you step on the brake pedal, and you get a bright red, you know, flash. It's super bright. And, uh, and I knew we had the voltage and the power to do it, but I just wanted it to, you know, be dazzling and, 
entertaining, make you feel like you hit a jackpot. You know, it just was, it was a, a cool idea, but it was more difficult to do than we thought. Uh, yeah, they did do it. You know, the magic was preheating the element, you know, before uh, hitting it with all the voltage. So, um, Flash was my largest selling game ever. Maybe that's when I was the most motivated in my life. I don't know. I think some of it was just like luck. And, uh, you know, this, this uh, we, we, we actually sold boxes that had xenon flash tubes in them. And when we showed the game, it shows way up high above you on poles, they would light up the whole game area. Like four or five of them would go off at, at once. And you could feel the flashes that you were causing, but there were other machines that were causing them also. Anyway, it was, it was a good game for us. I think it took us about a, a year to make them all. And, uh, and it stole Steve Bardek's production record away, and he was mad at me from then on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, uh, he, he was a good man. I'm not going to say that he wasn't, but, you know, he gave everybody, all the other designers, Barry Ausler, Dennis Nordman, my brother, you know, everybody else got a Christmas present. I didn't get one ever. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, okay. I mean, I didn't do that to Pat when he stole it away with uh, um, Adam's family. <laughs> you know, super game. You can't, you can't deny it. By the way, I have favorites of every designer um, that ever made a pinball machine, except Claude Fernandez. I'm not a fan. He stole half of Black Knight when I was making it, went to Bally and started on Flash Gordon. Half the game. So we weren't the first two-level machine. We were the, what we don't know. Actually, we do know. I did it first, but he copied it. Isn't that a horrible story? How many people know that? Am I lying? No. <laughs> he stole other things, too. That's what he did. Uh, all right, maybe I should get this picture of Jazz out of the way and have a picture here. On the other, the window. Two taps should open that, right? Okay, now I can go through. Okay, these were taken, this particular picture was taken, um, I don't know, a couple months ago, I think. Maybe, yeah, a couple months ago. These are Spider-Man VR on, on the, uh, uh, <coughs> On the line, <coughs> I should have taken some pictures when people were in the factory because normally it's full. But I wanted to, I wanted to have fac factory pictures that look like what you saw when you walked through at five o'clock, six o'clock, something like that. And, and that's about the only time that I had. Is that this is upside down? How can that be? <laughs> Are they all? No, that's not no. upside down. Okay. It's like, how do you get into your computer and turn the slide over? <laughs> you don't. Um, this is, I don't know how many of you have been to the factory, but okay, i got to stare at this. Yeah, this is a bunch of toppers for Game of Thrones, um, upper play fields. Um, it's interesting to watch all these people mass produce these things, uh, you know, and, and make 60 to 70 a day, sometimes less, sometimes more. Um, this is Jody. You know Jody? <laughs> Jim Jim, Jim. He's our, uh, a, a marketeer and a character. Very smart guy. Abrasive personality. But we get along <laughs> because I have one too. <clears throat> like, I'm not that happy. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm happy. I'm glad to be here. Also. Um, wow. Okay, this is some weird stuff that I have. It's like I made Star Trek side armor. This one, this particular design had the Starfleet emblem down below the ship. I mean, it's pretty much the same, but um, I found out that these would be $200 a piece to manufacture. So we kind of <laughs> cut back on that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I have two sets of them. Um, one black and one, one silver. Um, this is actually Roberto, who is a, uh, a great worker, and, and he knows everything about, about pinball uh, production. and problems too. Very smart guy. Um, he, he's an inspector at the end of the line and he catches a lot of stuff. Obviously not everything, but a lot. I'm going to say this too. I think, I think you guys even know it. I, don't, I have never opened up a pinball machine and had it working perfect except once. Once it happened to me in Germany. We brought over a, 
uh, it was Star Trek. And uh, it worked out of the box, completely and absolutely correct. And that's the only time. There's always something wrong in the box. Then when did it break afterwards? How say, long, wait, say it again. How long did it take to break after it worked? Oh, I have no idea. I left town. That was it. I was just there for a show. Just get out, right? You don't think you <laughs> stick around, do you? Okay, this, this guy is also, uh, he doesn't speak any English, but he's like, you know, kind of like the master cleaner. He cleans out cabinets, every speck of dust, anything that's uh, not in place, checking uh, stuff that's stapled in the bag that goes in and all that. Um, these are a bunch of Ghostbusters. This is a more recent picture. This may have been Wednesday, no, Thursday. Uh, and I walked through. There were a few people there. We're also building Medieval Madness. I don't know how many we built. They don't tell me, but it just seems endless. <laughs> and uh, they're all sold. We are a bit behind in production right now due to some supplier problems. And so we've got a lot of catching up to do. Stern is a big company, and this building is huge. The new building's awesome. It's, uh, I think it's not like 130,000 square feet, something like that. Um, and we're only using about half of it. The other half is for storage, pretty much, and um, parts and that. But we have two lines that are operational. And we've had some growing pains trying to get that all together, no doubt. Um, more Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters play fields. Um, these are in uh, carriers that go down the line. They have like uh, balls on the bottom that roll. Uh, it's not really, yeah, it's weird, I think, but they work. It works good. Um, more Ghostbusters with battle light. This is ramp land. Like, we're building many models simultaneously, so we stack all the ramps there. Um, and they're actually assembled nearby by uh, about five or ten ladies. They rip all the parts on them. Um, this is Dragon Land. It's a very fuzzy picture, though. I, I didn't take this picture. Yes, I did. All right, these are some upper play fields in Iraq, um, waiting to go on to Game of Thrones. This is the storeroom, the stock room. Uh, the wall on the left is the beginning, and I've got a bunch of pictures here. Well, I guess I took some out, but anyway, it's big and long. 4,000 parts in a pinball machine. 4,000. Many, many play fields. Um, we have a lot of different games going and coming in also so that we're ready for production. If we can't, you know, make one game for one reason or another, then we start building another model. Um, again, more play fields. This is not the same set of racks here. This is like our, our little arcade. It's actually a terrible place to play, to play pinball because right above our windows, and, you know, you look at the glass and you see this window. <laughs> not fun. Get, get down like this, you know, to, to not see the glare and reflections. The guy on the right, his name is uh, Elliot Iceman. <coughs> Excuse me. He is a, a very bright kid from uh, Purdue, mechanical engineer. I love working with him. Uh, whenever I work with people on my team, everybody gets to say what they want to say. It's, it's, a Steve Ritchie game is not just Steve Ritchie. And I've always had good teams and, and friends, you know, to help out. And I just say, I say this, I, you know, I love to hear ideas. If you have a good one and you want to give it to me, I'll take it. You know, if you've got a good idea, I, I just do that. I'm not insecure about it. I don't think I'm going to think of the last thing. I, you know, I don't worry about, oh, I don't know if I can think of another idea or something else to do. I just, I'm not insecure about it because some of us have a lot of ideas. Okay, so the guy on the left is Wayson Chang. He's a programmer. Um, I've worked with him a little bit. He worked on uh, Star Trek with us. This is like uh, big banners we have hanging in the factory of most of the games that we have made in recent years. It's interesting to look up, you know, and see all those things and how much grief we've gone through to make them happen. I'm not looking for sympathy, though. It is a pain to make a pinball machine. It's just a pain. I mean, yeah, you know, ask these guys like, like Yap or, uh, you know, Andy Highway. It's, it's tough. It's not so bad to make one or two. To make ten is, is uh, good, and you know, it's it's something. But you're at the base of the mountain when you want to build a thousand machines. The mountain is high. It just is. There's so much to do and coordinate and make things happen and. 
a lot of errors that you have to suffer through, especially if you're new at making them. It's just, it's a tough thing to do. Um, these are more pictures of the line. This is, this is, a, this is our main line, the one that's closest to, I'm looking like towards the entrance of the factory, and that's where I took this from. This is, uh, this is like, these are final testers in here, but again, it's late in the afternoon, not many of them are there. Usually there's about 20 people there. <coughs> you bored yet? Okay. Um, I'm kind of like a blunt speaker. <laughs> and I'm not bashful. So I'm going to stop right now and tell you guys the true stories. Honest, honest engine. Okay. I think I was in Seattle. And this, this guy and his, and his wife were sitting there and they, you know, it was questions. He was asking me the question. Um, well, first she said, uh, he has so many pinball machines that I, he wanted to get rid of the couch. And I said, no. <laughs> so this guy's like kind of looking down and I go, do you have any in your, in your master bedroom? Yes, there was a couple. <laughs> well, have you guys thought about bunk beds? <laughs> <laughs> they needed to think about that. All right, so that's a true story. Honest. Um, this is uh, Jody Dagberg and uh, John Borg. Good friend, good guy, good designer. Um, I don't know who he is. I have no idea. <laughs> okay, this is in the old factory. This is when we were making ACDC. Uh, this guy's a great tester. He still works there. The one next to him, too, with the run lights. This guy, this man says, I know I'm good looking. I know I'm good looking. <laughs> uh, this guy here is like the shortest man in the factory. And his job was to pick up the transformer and put it down in the cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was his job, and then put bolts in. It's like, some people are just mean. <laughs> <laughs> this guy, this guy still was stern too. His name is Gilbert. He is prob he's the star tester, no question. He finds problems. Occasionally we get testers who find problems and don't fix them, just sort of, because they don't want to deal with it. Um, and we try to get rid of them when we catch them. If we catch them, we do get rid of them. That's it. Uh, this guy's still there too. Great. A great. Uh, a great fixer, a great final tester with uh, a great sense of responsibility. Um, these guys too. Oh, that's Roberto and the, the other guy I told you cleans cabinets out and make sure they're all nice. Uh, these guys are too, they're mean. No, 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 they're good people. <laughs> um, this guy, this, this lady, this guy, this guy, this guy, I'm all moving on. Uh, this is Lewis. Lewis is awesome. Uh, he's, more, he's willing to do anything. He's helped me with a ton of stuff. I've helped him too. He's kind of like, uh, he's at, when the play fields come in, he wheels them over and starts inspecting them. And we've actually started polishing some, you know, inside. If, if, they're, if they look worth keeping or you know, less, if we can fix them, we will by polishing, if we can. I don't know if you've noticed, but the play fields look a lot better. This is a picture I took in, uh, I think it was like a steam bath or something. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's a crew of us. This is Ed Van Der Veen and his wife. <clears throat> they run the Texas Pinball Festival. My wife is on the left. I'm not in the picture. And, I don't know, Texas people, fun. We were on a cruise together. Um, this is Star Trek. Uh, that guy is no longer with us. Interesting story. Um, this, is, this is a Lucy. I, can, I can't tell all the stories. I just can't. Um, more Lucy. Okay, this is Barty. And she is the mistress of QC. The buck stops with her. She writes everything up. Um, I get a list of problems every day on every game we make. Uh, it, uh, she does the best she can. Uh, more Lucy's. Again, this is the old factory. Um, some upper play, no, lower play fields, sorry. And these might be Lucy's. They are, huh? Yeah. People working on the line, assembling, I'm not sure what. This picture is tiny for me. It's huge for you, but I can't see it from here. Um, yeah, these are Lucy's uh, lower play fields. 
uh, these guys aren't doing anything, they should be terminated. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, yeah, upside down play fields. Are we bored at looking at play fields yet? We must be bored of it. Yeah, we have to be. I love making this game. I think this game is pretty. It's like, I, uh, I don't know. John Yossi, who's in the room, did this backlash, and it's like one of my favorite backlashes of all the time. The Enterprise Edition. Where is it? Where's John Yossi? <laughs> Just this. It's like, that is so cool. It's coming around the planet and stuff. It's awesome. Um, fun to make. A lot of grief. Two programmers. One took over for another. I'm not going to go into it. <laughs> Those of you who know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. Those of you who don't, you don't know. <laughs> uh, this is a Whitewood. This is like uh, an LE Whitewood. Uh, how do I know? Because it's got clear inserts. And it's, uh, it's going to have multicolored LEDs under every one of them. This guy's name is Stephen Martin. He's an excellent artist. And uh, wow, super enthusiastic. He works with Greg Ferris and uh, production art. Greg, he's a cranky old man. <laughs> no, he's not. He's not a cranky old man. He's a good guy and an old friend. <laughs> he's messing around with uh, Lonelli. How many people think that Lonelli is a sexist game? <laughs> Two? Okay. Interesting. They're both men. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> okay, here, here's uh, John Trudeau. Uh, in his favorite position. Actually, he's, he's working on this game. This is an office. That, excuse me. That was an office in the old building. And John Borg and his. I just come in and take pictures. They sometimes they look shocked, like John. What are you doing? <laughs> this guy's name is Jim Shurd. He's like in the wiring and electronics department. Uh, clever guy. He can fix anything on a pinball machine, and he's a great player. He plays tournaments all the time. He's in several leagues. Uh, this, this guy is no longer with us, and I don't even remember his name. I don't. Uh, this is Dave Cadeau, who once managed an arcade. Um, he's now working in our lab, building up the games and uh, getting them wired. Prototypes. I really do have to blow my nose. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> I mean, I, when you have to, you have to. Yep. This is Rob Blakeman. Uh, Rob Blakeman is a very good mechanical engineer. He's like, uh, I don't know, he's like uh, so incredibly meticulous about drawings so that everything is right, every single detail, he'll write me an email saying, you have the wrong dash number on Plastic 98, it's supposed to be 99. Okay, so I to change them, uh, he's a very bright guy. And these two ladies, the, the one on the left is uh, Raina, um, and the one on the right is Gabby. Uh, she's like, Gabby is um, building materials, you know, rounding up parts. She sits right outside my office, and there's always a parade of men going by, too. <laughs> All day. Um, Raina is a, a great engineer. She's our harness lady, and she, she has a, a long history in the coin operated business, um, making harnesses and uh, and you know what? She's a great AutoCAD user, too. Sometimes I ask her, how do I do this in AutoCAD, even though I've been using it for 25 years or something. I don't know. Anyway, she knows stuff. Uh, this is Mike Redelpe. Um He's another mechanical engineer. He did the Dragon on uh, uh, Game of Thrones, among lots of other devices. Um, he's a character. We like to shoot. I don't know if you guys know that. We do like shooting. I don't want to kill anybody, but... I like shooting, and he does too. How many other people like shooting? Okay, I don't feel like such a criminal. Cause it's, like, <laughs> it's like, it's very controversial now. It just is. Everybody's thinking, you know, you know guns, guns are not bad or good. It's the people that point them and where they point them at. Um, that's just my opinion. Uh, this guy is an inspector also, um, a tester. This guy's still at the company, Jesse, and he's, uh, he's, he's been a very good employee. When he, in this picture, he had only been there for a few weeks. He picks up everything very quickly, and uh, he's moving ahead. I think he's in 
is either in customer service or part sales now. Wyman, Wyman Sheets, a good friend, a crazy man, a partner in crime. The man who did, well, you know, he's, he's, he's probably the best programmer there is right now. I, you know, I, I would match him, though, with Larry DeMar, if Larry DeMar was, was still working, uh, actually, in software or Eugene. They're all, they're all great. Wyman's got a passion, though, for excellent rules and uh, fun. But he's like such a high-level player that when I play the game, you know, I'd like, uh, like on ACDC, I, I, I beg him, can I please win an extra ball in this game? Can I please win it? It's too far out. You've got to move it up. And, and so he does. Uh, so we, we are a good balance. I'm with the, the bad players. I'm, I'm a little better than bad. I'm, I'm, I'm above average just because I play a lot. Um, but he is he's a great player, incredible champion. Uh, another Wei Sin Chang picture, he helped out with uh, running our speech and modes and missions on uh, Star Trek. Mike is a bad. This guy's a character, OK? He's got pipes, great pipes. He is the voice of the Klingon in uh, Star Trek. And um, I don't know, that's a, uh, it's a personal contribution when someone does that. You know, you got, you're doing your work, but, you know, if you really want to, you know, if you enjoy it and you get into it, it's awesome. That's now, it. You were the voice on Black Knight, right? Uh, say it again, please. You were the voice on Black Knight, right? The voice of... Black, Black Knight? Yes. Yeah, that was your voice, right? Uh, I, I, I'm the voice in Firepower. I'm, I'm the voice I, I'm all, in many of my own games. Not all, but many. <clears throat> and a lot of other people's games. Like, like Barry Osler stuck me in Comet. And I, <laughs> I said... What was it? Hey, turkey. <laughs> Come on, hit me. Now, that's me being this, uh, the, you know, the, the dunking deal. He thought he was making fun of me. I'll tell you another story, too. Interrupt the pictures. This is a true story also. Okay, um, in Chicago, we were big on fireworks, illegal fireworks. Now, I think I was like, I don't know, 37, 38 or something. And I found out I could get these M1000s. They're like gigantic. This big, silver, that big around with a big, long, waterproof fuse. So I went outside the building. Like Roscoe Street ended right at the Chicago River, and that was the side of the building you walked in here or there. Anyway, so we went down the river. And I, I put the first one down on the ground and walked away. Boom! The boom was so huge that the cops came. We ran inside right out. I was not expecting it. Uh, and about a week later, we were, this is the progression of, of dangerous stuff. You know. I don't know, I'm just kind of addicted to adrenaline, motorcycles, whatever. Anyway, I have a wrist rocket. I have it like this. I got an M1000 in here, and Eugene likes the fuse. My cigarette. I launch it into the river. And when it goes off, it's just as loud as the other one, maybe louder, and makes a huge plume of water. And the cops came. We were gone now already. And people inside the building, building, you know, they said, let us know when you're going to do that. You know, deep in the building. Anyway. Okay, this is also another true story involving fireworks. Barry Ausler is, he was and is a prankster. It's like, he, um... You put a car bomb once in my game, so I'm, we're playing along, and boom, all of a sudden there's a huge explosion, and the hole it fills up with smoke in my white room. Okay, I couldn't believe it, and I thought, what happened? That looks like a capacitor failure or something. <laughs> so I open it up, and I see what he did. So from then on, it was war. <laughs> he, had his, he had his desk against the wall with a window that overlooked the lovely Chicago River, and, uh, and his, his door was here, so... I lit bottle rockets, multiple, and put them, you know, and they would go, bah! slam up against the wall, and it would blow up, and he would go, you, never mind, <laughs> children in the room. Okay, so once the president, Ken Fedesna, saw me doing that, but he was, he was there for all the other fireworks, and I thought, uh-oh, and he goes, you know, if you put a piece of metal down, it won't burn the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> That's how he was. Uh, this is Lonnie Robb. Um, I've worked with him twice, I think. 
Star Trek and Elvis. Uh, this is some clown. <laughs> um, uh, it's a weird face. I don't want any more of those. Okay, this is, uh, I think I'm back to the beginning. Yep. Good, it's over. It's over. So that's my slideshow. Um, wow. I don't know if it's been an hour or not, but I don't care. I can, I, I can tell you the rest of my life. It's like, it, it has continued in a pinball vein as long as there was a company to make them. Okay? Um, and pinball's had its heavy duty ups and downs. I've spent long periods of time not working, 28 months uh, recently, about now, before I got back to Stern in uh, 2011. Um, I'll tell you right now, uh, I'm not stupid and I'm not gonna stand here and be, I don't know. Uh, I'm not stupid, but I'm t I'll just tell you this. It's, if you're 60 years old and you can't hear good, you're not getting a job anywhere, especially in California. It's all about young people there. Um, and what do I have? I have an opinion about that too. I have noticed that, I don't know, some, not all, but some people, young people have a work ethic that is not acceptable to me. And I, I just want to say that's, that's to their disadvantage, definitely. And um, I don't know. I, I, that's another strange opinion that I have, but it's like I, I can deal with uh, almost anything else. But, and, and most of the people that I work with are very hard workers. They're there for a long time. And Dwight, and, uh, uh, yeah, Dwight Sullivan's a character too, totally. We've, we've probably made, I think we've made around 52 or 53,000 machines together, sold that many. I think I've sold more with him than any, any other programmer. Um, Anyway, it is a, it's a team project. Every pinball I make, people get to speak their mind and tell me I want, to, I want them to be involved. And I don't mind if the uh, mechanical engineer is looking at the art and says, well, um, this could be maybe different. You know, maybe we could put this there. You know, everyone has a different idea. So we all look at everything together. I do reserve the right. You know, to make a final decision if I have to, and it's like, it doesn't happen often. Usually we just say, yeah, this is the right thing to do. Um, what else can I say about making games at Stern? It's fun, it's misery, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it is a lot of work. And it, but I gotta tell you this, I feel like I'm the luckiest guy on earth. I, I get to do what I love to do. And that's, uh, that's an important thing. Um, wow. I guess right now, I don't know what, what, what you guys have heard. There are some stories that are true, some I've told a few times. Does anyone know the story of high speed? Does anyone know the story behind high speed? Good. That's like, well, I know a couple of you guys do. Okay, so <clears throat> this was like 1982. The bottom had fallen out of the pinball business. So I talked to Mike Stroll at, at, uh, at Williams, and I said, uh, look, I want to go back to California and start a, uh, a video game company with a couple guys. And he said, sure. You know, so I was contracted to Williams to make two video games. And um, I, I had done well with, uh, with my pinball machines. And uh, when I got there, I thought, I'm going to buy a nice sports car. So I bought a Porsche 928. It was used. I think it had 30,000 miles on it or something. And uh, it was definitely an emotional purchase. You know what I mean? I looked at the car and I thought, this is just a space machine. And when you sat in it, the cockpit was like a jet fighter wrapped around you. And uh, you know, a big old manly shifter. And the clutch was stiff, you know? And it's like <clears throat> a very nice car with an aluminum V8 engine. And uh, you could sell cylinders. Remember that? Anyway, it went fast, um, and it was so easy to drive. It made anybody look good. It just did. Um, so I had the car for about three months, and my company was in a town called Loomis near Sacramento, and we were going to go back down to Silicon Valley to buy some parts that we needed, visit some friends, and come back, my partner and I, all in the same day. It's not that far away. Um, so we get on I-5. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge, brand new, 
you know, a freeway at that time. And that's what we call them, freeways, because you're not going to pay any tolls. It's awesome. What a concept. Okay, so five lanes in this direction, going up and down, some rolling stuff, and then big, flat, like in, in the middle of the Sacramento Valley, you cannot see the Cascade Mountains, and you can't see the Sierras. It looks like Illinois or Nebraska. Okay, that, that's part of it, as you come down from Sacramento and some of those areas. Anyway, I'm going this way, and I open the car up, and my partner's watching for me, you know, and just, you know. So it, it went 146 miles an hour, but we had to calculate it. The speedometer only went up to 55. It was dopey. Um, <laughs> you can calculate it, though, off, off the tachometer. So 146 miles an hour, smooth as glass. I'm paying attention to nothing but driving. There's some tomato trucks. It's 7 o'clock in the morning. Tomato trucks in the right lane and really no traffic. And then from the distance comes a highway patrolman. And my partner says, that's a cop. So yeah, I, I slow way down very quickly. And I, I'm coming down a hill. He goes over the hill. And I don't see him. I hit it again. We're going 146 miles an hour. I know it sounds dangerous and irresponsible. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of is, but I mean, it had new tires. It was a great time to do it on a brand new road with little traffic through an agricultural zone. You know, it's like that was the place to do it. So we're moving along for about 15 minutes, and I just kept it at 146. Maybe slow it down a little a couple times. Um, and then this, uh, a sheriff's car is coming with his lights on, screaming siren. And I was thinking, that could be for me. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he turned around in the median, and he chased me down. I didn't even wait for him. I just pulled over. You know. And uh, he got out of his car, and he says, just stay there for a second, OK? Uh, stay there. And so I did. Nothing happened for a couple minutes. And then the highway patrolman comes in in his black and white Mustang. You know, and does a giant broad slide in the gravel, and he's all angry, like stomping over in my car, and he tries to pull me out the window of the car. And I go, wait, <laughs> officer, I'll just get out. He throws me down on the hood, frisks me, puts handcuffs on me, and puts me in the passenger seat of his car. Okay, M meanwhile, more cops are showing up. There are a total of nine cop cars. <laughs> <laughs> and they're going through the car, looking for the stuff they stole, you know, or whatever. But there was nothing. And, uh, my partner tried to tell him, you know, they first came too. He tried to tell him, look, he just wanted to try the car out. And, uh, and so the cop comes back to the, to the car where I am. He takes the handcuffs off me and he goes, you want a cigarette? And I go, sure. And he says, why did you do that? And I said, because I wanted to try the car out. I wanted to go as fast as it could go. And there wasn't any place to do that. And this was the best, safest, Opportunity. I didn't hit anyone. There was no damage to anything, no harm done. And he goes, did you know I was behind you? And I said, no. You went over that hill, and I, I took off again. OK. <clears throat> he goes, I have to take you straight to court. This is all, you know. Um, and I'll tell you what, if court wasn't, you know, wasn't in session, you'd be going to jail. And I said, well, it's, that's a bummer. <laughs> so, so we went to court, and there's this commissioner there, and uh, he, uh, you know, on and on and on, and they told me that uh, I should never have been driving that fast, it's ridiculous, uh, uh, why did you do it? And I said, I wanted to try out the car, and uh, the, the officer spoke for me, he said, he wasn't trying to run away, he didn't know I was behind him, and uh, he did speak up for me, and that's like, uh, the commissioner said, you're not going to do that again, are you? I lied and said no. <laughs> <laughs> so in order to get out of the building, I had to pay $250, which I had on me. And uh, I got 90 days restricted driving for business only. <laughs> okay. Little business in the country behind a house. Uh, and then reckless driving which was a drag. A few months later, the video game market fell through the floor. Williams had lost $17 million on various video games like uh, Star Rider, is that it? The oh, yeah. Laser Disc game, you guys remember that video thing? <laughs> and some other stuff, you know, it's like, uh, I mean, Williams was hurting bad. And um, they couldn't buy my game. 
it was called Devastator. It devastated me. So it's like, uh, I said, well, okay, um, can I have a job back and make pinball machines? And Mike Scroll said, sure, come on. So packed up everything, moved back to Chicago, and started working on a game. And it just crossed my mind. It would be great to make a pinball machine about the police chase. <laughs> and so that's what I did. <clears throat> um, wow, I've been blabbing for a long time. It doesn't bother me at all. Okay. Um, does anyone have any questions? I can. <laughs> yes. Yes. I, I'm not going to hear. You, you might have to pass it on, Dave. Okay. Now, now I, I know. I know George Gomez. You know, obviously, is the um, you know your boss, right? Yeah. So uh, I was listening to two uh, coast to coast, and, and and George was saying that uh, you know he has certain limitations that he gives you when you build a pinball pinball machine. Basically, keep it under the glass. <laughs> Flip has to have flippers. Uh, um, those it, are limitations it, I put on myself. Okay, I, yeah, yeah. So, so I, but anyways, um, have you ever had some constraints where you say, you know, I want this feature in my machine? And, many and, times. And, many and, times. And, and how you guys work that out? Well, thank you. We work it out by me doing it, and they accept it, or I leave the company. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's not what George said. You know what? Okay, that's 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 not always true. I mean, I I will make concessions, but I'm not. A, what is it? He said you're a fighter. I am not willing to compromise pinball for any reason. Mm -hmm. I, I can put less in a game, that's okay, but I want my games to be fun. And I, I do want to make it clear that um, even while I'm making a game, I am thinking how many can we make, how many can we sell. I'm in the business to make pinballs to sell them, because if we don't sell them, there's no money. And if we, there's no money, there's no company. And so I'm always thinking about selling pinballs, what will sell the most. Luckily, it comes down to having a player and a buyer who is satisfied or loves the way it plays. Right? If you love it, you're going to buy it, and we sell pinball machines. Anyway, I, there hasn't been many things. Like, one of them was, uh, okay, on Spider-Man, I had four toys. <clears throat> and Gary would say, you can only have three. <laughs> and, uh, he, you know, I said, I can't have three. It's like... He goes, how about if you just build a house with, you no, know, the words Doc Ock on the outside of it, out of butyrate. Uh, and I said, Gary, do you know that there's a whole movie, a whole movie about Doc Ock? Okay, that guy's like, you know, he was important. And uh, it went on and on. He would just be a grumpy. Uh, one day, we were screaming at each other so loud that everybody in the meeting just got up and left. They were scared. And it's like, it was nasty. But... Um, it stayed in, because it didn't cost us that much more. Um, other, other times I have conceded stuff, I just have. If I feel like I have, you know, one too many ideas, you know, in the game. I, like, Star Trek is pretty loaded when you get down to it. You know, the laser and all the LEDs and the stuff on the side, and uh, it's, it's elaborate. And uh, I didn't have to remove any toys, but I think that maybe that might have been a little bit over the top, but you don't think so, so I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. Hi, I love your games, first of all, so thank you for making your games. Thank you, I'm honored. Thank you so much. And uh, I know you did some voiceover work, like in Mortal Kombat. Yeah. And, uh, and, but I don't know exactly, I love that game, and I don't know exactly what you said, so would you mind telling I, us? I can't believe that you're in a pinball seminar. I don't <laughs> <laughs> that Pinball's my first love. Steve. I'll try a few. It's like, I don't remember everything. Okay. Uh, uh, I was Shao Kahn, who was kind of like the narrator. Um, it's hard for me to remember. I got coached by a guy named Dan Forden, standing outside the studio, and Ed Boone, too. He's like, he's the designer of the game. And he's like, they're telling me how to speak, and I, I like that. Whenever anybody's in in a studio, you need coaching. You need somebody who's got a good ear to hear everything, because you don't really hear what it sounds like. You hear it in the headphones, but you don't hear what it sounds like in the studio. So, <coughs> this is an old Chinese man, old, I don't know, 200 years old. Fatality. <laughs> uh, <coughs> I, you know, I hardly remember any lines. I did not do Toasty. <laughs> Dan, Dan Forden did Toasty. Finish him. Nice killer. Um, Finish him. Fatality. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs>
finish him. <laughs> get, get over here. What? Get, get what? over here. <laughs> what? Yeah. What? I can't do it. <laughs> get over here. <laughs> really? <laughs> you know, Shao Kahn said get over here? No, a uh, scorpion. When he, when he does the scorpion okay. grappling hook there. Then... Right. That was my voice? Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think so. Maybe. Well, you... Get over here. <laughs> I, don't know. I have this devil that lives inside of me. He came out for no fair for ACDC. Let's come out. He says bad things to people too. Very rude things. Most Wyman thinks of as many as I do. You know, like you're worthless. How are you doing? See it. Do you feel you can be as creative as you want to be, even though you have to do licensed games rather than originals today? Um, I feel good. I get to do what I want because I'm the king. It's good to be king. <laughs> now, I think you're right, and that's like, there have been big restrictions, okay? I'll just say this. I'll say HBO was extremely difficult to work with. Disgusting. No humor, right? I didn't want nudity, but they said no nudity, no humor, and cut back on the violence. Okay? I don't know how many seen Game of Thrones. It's like, yeah. They wouldn't let us make, make it authentic. But in some cases, I would agree with them. Mm -hmm. Like originally, um, I sort of hate to say this because I'm a bad man, the sword, you know, that holds the balls back, comes down, and there was a guy bent over like this with no head. <laughs> and the ball was going to be his head. Uh, after oh. the beheadings, you know, yeah. um, in the Middle East, we decided not to do that. And uh, even before, they called me up and said, you cannot do that. We couldn't do anything. It was to, like two young ladies, and it's like, I just, never mind. <laughs> hey, uh, but I hear you. We wouldn't have to deal with that at all. Um, once I asked, you know, uh, you guys know uh, Matt, uh, Cristiano, and, uh, and Rick from Bay Area Amusements. Uh, they own, you know, all the old Williams trademarks. And I, I said, what if I made a Black Knight game, another one? What, what would you guys want? <laughs> I'm not promising. I'm not saying anything. <laughs> I, I'm not. But I said, what would it cost us? And he, he, they said, we each want a game. That's it. Well, that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I, uh, as I would love to make um, yeah, a, uh, a unique title, you know, a non-license. It's, it's tough, though, to say, well, it's difficult to say that uh, you've had great success with titles. Why rock the boat? Why change things? I don't know. I, and I agree with it somewhat. I do. A good title will help propel everything. You know, there are things you love. You, you know you love Ghostbusters, the movie, and it's like it just pulls you right in because you remember all that. Good music, funny stuff in our past. Um, I'm ready for another question if you got any. I have a question. Okay. This morning, John Trudeau said that he designs starting at the LE level and then taking things up for the pro. Yes. Do you do that? Yes. I mean, I, I wouldn't describe it exactly like that. If, uh, if you look at Game of Thrones, okay, it's the, 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 there's quite a bit different. You know, the play, upper play field gone. There's a lot of other things had to change, too. Uh, but yeah, that's how we start because. It's crazy trying to add things on after you've got a design. You know, it's got to be built in originally, and you have to think about what you're going to eliminate or change for the lesser price model. Um, so, yeah. That's you're the king of flow. <laughs> Thanks. Steve. I'm Steve. Ooh. Jim. <laughs> <laughs> what are your three favorite shots out of all the games you've done, and, and kind of why? And is there a shot that you haven't done yet that you, you are just Bell trying to get? ACDC. Premium and LE. That's fun. Uh, that's one. Um, wow. It was totally fun to put the ball in a lock shot at the top of firepower. Mm -hmm. And out of the plunger, if you you know, if you thumbed it, it would go bing bang and it's going in the hole. And you needed that third one. And that was the hardest one to hit because it was the furthest away. Third shot. Let's see. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, those those two, I I can think of. And so the the rest are just kind of like 
Uh, well, they're, they're bad shots. That's it. They're bad. The rest are bad shots, and those are the only two movements. <laughs> <laughs> what, about, what about a Picard maneuver? What do you think of that? What did he say? A Picard maneuver? <laughs> Picard maneuver. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, you're right. That, and it's a comfortable shot, making the orbit and then up the ramp. It's, it, it's a similar thing can be done on Star Trek in, in darkness. Um, any other questions? Hey Steve. So what about the opposite? Wait, what's your name? Bob. Bob, I'm Steve. <laughs> <laughs> the opposite of that. Do you have any shots or any ideas that you look back on and say, what was I thinking? Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah, I didn't like the the left orbit roll down on the right side of T3. Mm -hmm. I didn't hit slingshot too often. I didn't like that. And I, I, I didn't fix it. I don't know why I didn't fix it. I mean, I had an opportunity, but then when I really looked at it and felt this thing, I mean, I, I, who knows what happened? I mean, if, if you make the ball go around really fast, it doesn't hit the slingshot, but it didn't always go around real fast. And so I should have fixed that. Um, other things, uh, I'm not real happy about what's happened on the top of Game of Thrones, but I'm not going to talk about it either. <laughs> I can't. I have nothing to say about it. Uh, I don't know. Next question. You have to come up here. You have to come up. Can you can you talk a little about Black Knight and how it came about? Do you have any? Yeah, sure. Um, okay, one night I was sleeping and dreaming that I was the Black Knight. No, that's not what happened. I just like, I like the idea of a bad character because if the player is a good guy and you got a bad guy, you know, the battle between good and evil is a, it's just a winner. You know, it's like, like every great, you know, Schwarzenegger movie, <laughs> sorry, or a, a lot of movies start out with some horrible wrong is done to a guy and he's usually like, you know, Steven Seagal or somebody like that, and, uh, and also a murderous, dangerous um, uh, soldier, we'll say, a warrior. Anyway, that's, that's what it came from, and it's like, and I thought, you know, I don't want to be that guy. I am the Black Knight. <laughs> they lowered my, my pitch with an uh, even-tied harmonizer. I like that thing. You know, I, I brought one to a show once, and this woman yells out, I need that for my kids! <laughs> Get in your room. <laughs> Do one more bad thing, and I will twist your neck. <laughs> Sorry about that. How are you doing? <laughs> so is there ever, uh, is there any themes out there that you never got to develop against? Or like, is there a dream theme for you that you never got to make? I'm working on it right now. Yeah. Really? Uh, yes. Wars? I really am working on it. So it's a theme you always wanted to do? It's what? It's a theme you've always wanted to do? Yes. All right, nice. <laughs> Star <laughs> Since the beginning of and? it. Yeah. Okay, Star Wars? Yeah. Uh, All right. And? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's called the Beige Knight. <laughs> he's kind of a nice guy, you know. He's just kind of like, you know, taking it. He's like, uh, he's friendly, you know. He's someone you love to know. <laughs> okay. Um, just want to say to you guys, it's really fun to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, Thank you. Thank you.